Times, Adrian Goldberg, and welcome to the Byline Times podcast. The Byline Times is what the papers don't say, what radio doesn't report, and what telly doesn't tell you. This time, with the Labour Party gathered for its annual conference in Liverpool, a warning from Keir Starmer's former strategic campaigns advisor, Simon Fletcher, that the party can't just assume it will win the next election by default. Writing at bylinetimes.com, Simon, who also worked for Jeremy Corbyn and Ed Miliband, says that a strategy based on caution is a big risk. We'll hear from him shortly, along with our political editor, Adam Bienkoff. Before that, though, just a reminder that the Byline Times podcast is funded by subscriptions to the Byline Times, our wonderful monthly newspaper, which has exclusive content that you cannot read online. The great thing about the Byline Times is there's no shadowy oligarch or millionaire backer telling us what to say. We can report without fear or favour, because our funding comes from ordinary subscribers, people like you. So please subscribe, if you can, to the Byline Times. You get more details over at our website, bylinetimes.com. That's at bylinetimes.com. And if you have taken out a subscription, thank you. Welcome then to Simon Fletcher and Adam Bienkov. And Adam, please just set the context. Labour going into this conference, showing a healthy lead in the polls at the moment. Yeah, so it's a very different picture from this time last year. Keir Starmer went into his conference, Labour conference, this time last year in a very different position behind in the polls. There was a lot of whispers within the party about potentially even a a challenge against him. And there was a general sense that he hadn't really made much of an impact as Labour leader. That continued after the conference period, but everything changed around the turn of the year and the Partygate scandal, which really transformed Labour's fortunes, but ultimately didn't really have a lot to do with the Labour Party or with Keir Starmer. And since that point, Labour has sustained a sort of healthy lead, and it's a, it goes up and down slightly from month to month, but it's around sort of 10 points, or well, 7 to 10 points ahead of the Conservatives. And he now goes into this conference uh, with a new Prime Minister, Liz Truss, in power, big doubts within the Conservative Party and, and with, among the public about her. And in, in many respects, I think he's been an incredibly lucky leader of the opposition. Had things gone differently, had Johnson behaved differently during the pandemic, we could be in a very different position now than Stummer now finds himself in. But essentially, it's disillusionment with the Conservatives rather than enthusiasm for Labour that is driving Labour's lead in the polls. Well, certainly that's what Starmer's critics say, that they, that they say that he hasn't really set out a, a huge vision for the country. And I think even Starmer supporters would would concede that he hasn't yet set out exactly what, what he wants to do as prime minister. What his supporters would say in his defence is that nothing really happens by default in politics and that he has had to work very hard to transform the party's reputation from uh, the last general election when Labour suffered a really big defeat under Jeremy Corbyn. And they said that this has all been a deliberate strategy. So there is a real argument there over whether this is sort of good luck, the Labour in a position that they are in the moment, or whether it actually has come by design. And Simon, I guess you've been here before, given your long service with the Labour Party, a healthy lead in the polls, but the nagging fear that when the election comes, it might turn out to be very different. Well, this is the thing that hangs over Labour Party members and supporters. I think, you know, the two most obvious examples in 1992, when a very large numbers of Labour supporters thought we we would win the general election and, and John Major won it instead. In my own experience of the 2015 election, I was working for Ed Miliband and I was in the HQ when we got the exit poll, which showed Tories were going to get a majority. And I think everybody is scarred by that. I feel that there is something of the difference between those two examples and this time, which is the collapse in the Tories' credibility over the economy. And we've seen that sliding throughout the year. And that is a problem for the Tories because whatever else happens, they traditionally are pointed to their strength in terms of the managing of the economy. So I, I do think that the, I suppose, as far as I would say, we should get used to the idea of the possibility of a Labour government. But at the same time, we can't treat that as something that could happen by default. You write very specifically, a strategy based on caution is a big risk. And if you were asked to identify one single characteristic of Keir Starmer that defines him, if you didn't know him, you might say caution is that defining characteristic. 
Well, I think it's a mixed bag. If we look at things that have happened in the last year, where the Labour Party has struck out on a sort of defining position, if we take, for example, the energy price freeze, then I think the Labour Party was able to command much more of the argument. And as we go into the general election, it's not possible to face Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng and the rest of them simply by holding back. They are going to be on the offensive, whether we like it or not. We may think that what they're doing is wrong, but they're going to fill up the airwaves with their views and with what they're doing. And you can't just sit back because you, you just get pushed out of the way. So I, whatever people's individual personal characteristics, the party needs to find a way to occupy the space that speaks to the vast majority of people who are really feeling the squeeze at the moment. It is often said that oppositions don't win elections, governments lose them. And there is perhaps an argument, isn't there, for just letting the Conservatives make sufficient mess for you to look like the obvious alternative? Yeah, I I mean, obviously, the present situation that the government faces is very bad for them. And they've had to come back out with an overhauled position where they're zigzagging around departing positions they only announced a few months ago under the previous prime minister. So it, it, the situation is very bad for them. But I come back to this point. If you allow politics to be determined by other people because you sit back, then you are at great risk of being unable to def- define the agenda on your own terms. And that in the end, people who define the agenda tend to win. Obviously, we should always let people make their own mistakes, but we should try to create the framework as much as possible that it suits, in this case, the agenda of the Labour Party. Yeah, given your role, though, your previous closeness to Keir Starmer, if you're warning that you can't have a strategy based on caution, that can't help but sound like a bit of a criticism of his current leadership style. I think it's more that we're going into the conference, we've got a change in the Prime Minister, we're getting closer and closer to a general election, and I think that the Labour Party's got to say, it's not really criticism, it's basically saying, The Labour Party has got to say and do more to explain to people what it stands for in that situation, because it cannot let the situation drift into hoping for a Labour government by default. Now, I have to say, I think that there are some positive signs. For example, this week, Bridget Phillipson, the Shadow Education Secretary, announced some really good stuff around childcare, which I think will go down well. I think that the leadership has been very, very clear on the fracking issue, for example, in Parliament. I thought Ed Miliband was absolutely spot on the way he took down Jacob Rees-Mogg's arguments. So there are certainly signs of some clarity and just want to see some more of it this week at Labour Party conference. Adam, the examples that Simon mentions may well have some resonance with parts of the electorate. But if you look back to the 2019 election, Boris Johnson, a great, handy, easy to understand phrase, get Brexit done. When you look back at Labour, under Blair, things can only get better. I guess that's the point that Simon's pointing to, that there isn't this overarching sense of mission associated with Keir Starmer, this big idea or this belief that people can hold on to that things really will be different if they vote for Labour under him. Yeah, I think that's I think that's a fair criticism. And I think I'd, I'd agree with Simon that there have been some signs of improvement in recent months. I think the, particularly on the energy issue, I think Labour eventually did come out over the summer with a clear position on capping the cost of energy bills. I think that was good. But going into this conference, what is the big issue that Labour are campaigning on? I think the the Guardian had a sort of briefing that Keir Starmer's going to go into the next election, scrapping the House of Lords and having elected Senate, which, you know, is sort of longstanding Labour policy anyway. And it's not something that's really sort of going to capture the imagination of people and is largely you know relevant to, to many voters. And there hasn't been that sort of sort of clear single single issue, other than to point to the the government and say, look, they're, they're making a, a big mess of this, and, and we would essentially be more competent. And, and I think that that's that's the risk that they 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 have is, is they tried that with, with Johnson, just saying, look, Johnson's like incompetent, he's a mess, we would just be much more competent at running the economy. And they're trying something very similar with this trust, even though she's a very different politician. And as Simon says, having a quite a radical agenda and, and it appears to have clear answers. Lots of public may not look too closely at the details of her tax policies, may just say, look, she's cutting taxes. That's great. And also 
we don't know when the next election is going to be. We could potentially, some of these policies could lead to a short term boom in the in the new year. Trust could decide to go for an early election. And what, what will Labour's message be in that election? Will it simply be we're going to reverse tax cuts? We're going to put up people's tax? What is their alternative to the sort of trust agenda, which on the face of it seems, yes, it seems very radical and, it, and economists say it won't work, but at least it's clear for the public to understand. I don't think Labour have a similarly clear agenda for the country. At least yeah. it, and it, it's, it's arguably not a very great grabby slogan is it to say we'll increase your taxes now as a result of what many observers would regard as the financial recklessness of Kwasi Kwarteng's financial statement his recent mini budget economists many of them say that it is inevitable that to pay for the level of borrowing that we're going to need to fund all this we are going to have to increase taxes. So you might say any hard-headed politician is going to have to acknowledge that. But do you want to be leading Labour into the election saying that? Because that will then play to those traditional optics around Labour. Huh, look, they're the party that likes to increase taxes. Yes, and I, and I, but I think the, the the sort of opportunity that Labour see from the current crisis is that they, they suffered, I think particularly under Ed Miliband and Jeremy Corbyn, they were portrayed by the Conservative Party as being fiscally irresponsible. And now the tables are very much turned. The IFS saying that the, the, the government's plans are unsustainable. And I think the, the, sort of the clear temptation for Labour is to say, well, we, we are the party of fiscal responsibility, not the Conservative Party, and, and try and win over centre ground voters. Like that. I think that's, that's clearly their intention. Whether or not that will actually convince people and whether that's actually a compelling narrative the people who are suffering at the moment, are they really going to vote Labour for fiscal res- responsibility? Or would they be more attracted to vote for Labour if they're actually, if they're actually offering them something which will help them through this current crisis? It remains to be seen. Simon, you've worked closely with Keir Starmer. I'm just interested to know how much of the caution that people associate with him is his nature, the way he really is. How much is that a tactic hoping that the Conservatives will make sufficient mistakes to allow Labour back into power? I don't think it's possible to do politics purely by projecting a sort of tactic of your personality. I think that you, in the end, you, you know, your approach does reflect both your personal style and the political content. If you take somebody who is also generally seen as being quite, perhaps cautious isn't quite the right word, but certainly not somebody who is a tub thumper, you know, if you take Harold Wilson, for example, Despite that kind of understated approach, he was able to oversee a period of great reform in British society and British politics, not just on the economy, but also in sort of social terms. So I think that it doesn't necessarily follow that someone's sort of generally rather cautious demeanour can't lead to quite big change. The difficulty in the situation is that it, it, it can't just be fought out on the question of competence, though. I can agree with the points that Adam was making about that. What we're seeing at the moment is a complete jumping off the cliff of people's living standards for very large numbers of people and a highly unstable economic situation. And that means that the policy agenda and the sort of sense of of the Labour Party has to speak to that really serious, almost visceral experience that millions of people are facing. And I think that for me, that's the issue. So whether or not it's down to the individual's personal style, neither Kirsten or Rachel Rees are kind of, you know, big rhetorical type speakers and so on. The real question is, do their policies or will their policies meet the concerns and needs of people who are facing a completely unprecedented collapse in their living standards? Yeah, and that might be the moment, mightn't it, for a Labour prime minister to talk about nationalising the energy supplies in this country, possibly nationalising the water industry, perhaps nationalising the railways, which in many parts of the country are in a state of chaos, to talk about the NHS and serious radical reform, as well as additional funding that you can argue it needs. You could argue that this is just the moment to be bold and talk into those areas. But it seems to me that whether through his own personal ideology or caution, again, we come back to that word, Starmer isn't ready to grasp that particular nettle. Well, I mean, the strange thing about the situation is at at the very point of which there is a stronger, probably a stronger public argument for 
public ownership of some of the utilities than we've seen for a very long time. That has been the point at which the Labour Party has, in many of many cases, moved away from it. You take the railways, where actually I think they've probably clarified that the public ownership policy is, is will be maintained, although we, we'll have to keep a watching brief on it. But if you take the railways, the, the franchising system completely collapsed during COVID. You've mentioned the energy situation. And we've got the water, the scandal of water waste being pumped into the seas and the rivers. All of these things, exactly the point with COVID and all these other major issues facing us. There is a stronger case than there's been for a very long time for public ownership. And at that, that point, we're backed away from it. And it's not simply a kind of abstract point. It's that people can see much more clearly than perhaps they could have done before why the change in the way those industries are, is run is actually relevant to them. That is a problem. And that, I think, will there will still be arguments about that going into an out-of-Labour Party conference. And is that an area where you feel that Starmer could be bolder and actually should be bolder, A, because it's the right thing to do, and B, because it would win votes? Yeah, definitely. During the COVID pandemic, people saw the need for better, if you like, telecommunications, better internet and so on. So a policy in favour of greater state intervention in that industry seems to me to be something that could be sold to people as a step forward. Or if you take water, we just talked about the waste and sewage in the in the rivers. There is a case for projecting a much stronger agenda around those things, which could be popular. And in truth, on some of these things like that, the NHS cannot go on as it is. We have to deal with not just the underfunding, but the amount of waste that goes into the private sector in the NHS. So yeah, absolutely 100%. The Royal Mail, people really come to rely on the Royal Mail during the pandemic. And yet we've got profits going through the roof whilst the workforce is having to go on strike to get a better pay deal. So that over and over and over and over again, we're seeing examples of policies that could be popular and go further. And absolutely the leadership of the Labour Party should be considering those. I'm always dipping into Alistair Campbell's diaries about the Blair years, uh, fascinating reading and just his obsession as a former tabloid journalist as he then was and as Blair's spin doctor with keeping Rupert Murdoch on side, getting the right wing newspapers on side. I, I don't detect there's that kind of almost mania from the current Labour Party. But at the same time, you know that if Labour makes certain suggestions, it will be accused of trying to reverse Brexit, go against the will of the people. It will be accused of trying to bring back the 1970s. How mindful does a Labour leader have to be about the big structural issue in our press that the vast majority of it is rapidly pro-Tory? Look, it is It is a big issue. And, what, and obviously one of the differences that we have now compared to previously is the flourishing of online media and alternatives to the traditional press. But it is a big issue. All I would say is, like, we've seen in other countries, France and Germany and, and elsewhere, their governments intervening into the utilities of their economies. It seems to me that there is a public appetite for that, potentially, that there has not been, and certainly wasn't in the case of the period around the time of the Labour government, but also the Labour government got itself into a pickle over some of those issues. If you take, for example, the 97 Labour government introduced a partial privatisation of the London Underground, which, you know, I don't think we did it at the behest of the media or anything, but, you know, it was kind of the kind of whole thing of the private sector that we've talked about. It was a disaster. So there are times when the kind of pressure for these things has to be resisted because the alternative is far worse. There is a problem, absolutely no doubt about it, but there is some diversity in the press. There's, there is further diversity in the online media and necessary to put the right message to the public. Uh, otherwise, you're certainly just going to get pushed around. How serious a threat at the next election do you think Liz Truss is to Keir Starmer? Well, I think in the sense that she's she's not Boris Johnson, she's a threat. So uh, Johnson's ratings had really collapsed uh, over the course of the last year. And I think that Labour had really kind of got the measure of him and knew how to beat him at the, the next general election. List Truss, in some respects, on paper, looks like a, a much easier opponent for, for Labour to beat. She doesn't have the charisma of Johnson and her policies are also seem to be much less popular, according to the opinion polls. She also 
has abandoned the seems to have abandoned the leveling up agenda of Johnson. We could argue about how much that really existed in the first place, but at least there was a kind of rhetorical intent to level up the country and, and help be, help distribute the wealth to people who need it most. She seems to have abandoned that, which is quite easy for Labour to attack. But at the same time, looking at the other side of the coin, she does seem to have a clear message. She wants to have low taxes. She's invoking memories of Thatcher and Reagan. And it's easy for people to understand. And as we've been discussing, Labour doesn't have an equivalent so far, have an equivalent message that is easy for, for people to understand and an alternative to that. And if she does continue down this path of slashing taxes and supposedly pro-growth, it could lead to a short-term boom and the Conservatives could go into an early general election. And I think it's Labour will have to think long and hard about exactly what they go, what message they go into that election with, because at the moment it's not clear. It would be very difficult for them to go in and say, look, we're just going to raise all of your taxes again. And at the moment, they don't really seem to have an alternative to that on the table. How significant is the drop off in Labour membership, do you think, Adam? There's clearly a faction of the Labour Party or former Labour members anyway, who believe that Jeremy Corbyn was unfairly treated who perhaps will not campaign at the doorstep for Keir Starmer. And if you follow social media anyway, there is a sense of a party endlessly at war with itself. Well, there's a sort of caricature of of Labour Party members, that a large part of them are very left-wing and and pro-Corbyn, et cetera. Actually, yes, Corbyn had a lot of support, obviously, from Labour Party members, but so did Keir Starmer. And he won the Labour leadership on a platform of essentially inheriting and keeping the majority of Jeremy Corbyn's platform and agenda and has bit by bit abandoned that. So that has caused a lot lot of anger among many Labour Party members, not just on left, but but just across the board, there are lots of Labour Party members who assumed that he would broadly be keeping Corbyn's agenda on things like nationalisation, which he has not done. So there, there is a lot of anger, and I think that's inevitably led to a decrease in the membership. How that will affect the next election is always difficult to say. I mean, ultimately, you know, we can argue about how much sort of on the ground campaigning actually influences elections or whether it's it's more the air war and the sort of overall public image of the parties. But it's certainly, I think, you know, Labour would rather keep a large membership than not. I think the sort of broader problem is if Starmer isn't managing to infuse his own membership, then what chance does he have of infusing the border public? And uh, say, say you want about Liz Truss, she did manage to mobilise Conservative Party members behind her in this in the previous leadership campaign, and you cannot rule out the possibility that she'll be able to do the same with the public as well. And that is a problem, isn't it, Simon, that Labour doesn't seem to have that enthusiasm across the party for Keir Starmer. He doesn't appear to have been able to build this broad church of support behind him to head into another election. Yeah, I think most Labour Party members, most of all, want a Labour government. And I'd say, therefore, I don't think that what's happened is there's been a huge eruption of conflict across the majority of the membership. Instead, what we've seen is a sort of falling away of people from membership. Quite a significant uh, falling away, isn't it? Isn't yeah. It? And if we look at the last election results to the Labour Party National Executive Committee, a huge drop in turnout, that is a problem because that reflects, you know, if you like, a kind of enthusiasm problem amongst those people who have not left. So that's an issue. We're in a strange situation where we've got the largest wave of strikes and industrial disputes we've seen in decades, i.e. a kind of mobilisation of a section of the electorate against what's happening to them economically and in terms of government policy and so on. And yet at the same time, a decline in, in the people who've chosen to become politically active through the Labour Party. That is a very strange state of affairs, by the way. I think it is a problem for the party, because although it is true that in the end elections are probably won and lost at a national level, there are multiple local battles that take place, not just in the few weeks of the election campaign, but for the months and months and months before it. And you know, to have a falling away of enthusiasm is, a, is it really makes that much harder to, to deliver on. Yeah, and you can argue that that is 
in some part at least, directly down to the actions of Keir Starmer. He has sought to remove people who were associated with Corbyn's views on Israel in particular. And whether or not you agree with Corbyn's view on Israel and Palestine, that's clearly caused ill feeling within the party, the sense that old Labour hands, people like the film director, Ken Loach, no longer have a home in the Labour Party. There's an element of that which has made, I think, many Labour supporters feel uncomfortable. I think there's two or three things that were promised in the leadership election that have not been delivered on. There's obviously the 10-point pledge commitments that were made, the sort of big policy heading. But I think there's a broader point, which was that Keir's leadership wouldn't oversteer from the previous leadership, particularly on the issues of policy, but more generally that there would be a pursuit of unity and pulling the party back together after a very divided period. That has certainly not been delivered on, quite the opposite. And that has led to a lot of disaffection and a lot of people feeling that what they voted for was not being delivered. Now, that's quite a widespread feeling and it stretches beyond the, if you like, the Jeremy Corbyn left or the campaign group left, right the way through into big chunks of the soft left and the centre ground of the party. You know, and that's what I, partly what I mean about the kind of falling away of enthusiasm, because that reaches into the, the kind of, if you like, the, cent- the centre ground of the Labour Party is con- to the left of the centre ground of the British public. And that centre ground is somewhat disaffected. Been really fascinating to speak to you. We'll see what happens. Big challenges ahead for Keir Starmer, clearly, notwithstanding the poll lead. Thank you very much indeed, Simon Fletcher. Great to meet you. Thanks also to Adam Bienkoff, Byline Times political editor. And don't forget, if you want to support our work here on the Byline Times podcast, please consider taking out a subscription to the Byline Times. It's a brilliant monthly newspaper edited by Hardeep Matharu. As I said earlier, you get content there that you do not get online. It is a great read and it keeps us on air as well. Head over to bylinetimes.com for details of how to subscribe. I'm Adrian Goldberg. We'll see you again soon. Cheers now. Bye bye. <laughs>